I think we're all set to go here, so let me start by introducing uh, our plenary speaker for this morning. Uh, he probably doesn't require much in the way of introduction. Um, he's a former engineer with Lockheed Martin, uh, but now president of his own company, Pioneer Rocket Plane, which I believe is an XPRIZE competitor, is that right? Uh, that is correct. And uh, he's also uh, chairman of the National Space Society Executive Committee. Um, we probably know him best as the author of the Mars Threat Concept, uh, which uh, uh, looks like it may revolutionize uh, mission planning for traveling to the Red Planet. Uh, this concept was first unveiled to the public, I believe, at ISDC 1989 in Chicago. Is that more or less right? Okay, 1999 in Anaheim. Um, he'll be talking to us today on the exploration and human settlement of Mars. I'd like to welcome Dr. Robert Zubrin. By the way, those of you who haven't heard, I've got a book out called The Case for Mars, uh, Plan to Settle the Red Planet, Why We Must. Uh, those that want them, uh, they're available here at the end of the talk for $25. You buy them, I'll autograph them. You also have some literature from Univelt that Fred Ordway has brought here, um, a flyer detailing um, several new books about Mars exploration uh, that they are going to be publishing. All right, um, maybe have the first chart. Okay, I'm gonna to talk today about uh, how I think we can get humans to Mars uh, within a decade, uh, either a decade from now or a decade from whenever anybody turns on the money. Um, and if there's time, I will uh, try also to talk at least somewhat about uh, the long-term vision of uh, what humans can do on Mars, not only initial pilot emissions, but the way of colonizing uh, the planet. Okay. And uh, uh, this chart here says I'm from Martin Marietta. As uh, Mike uh, indicated, I'm not with Martin anymore. I have my own company now. But one of the great benefits of working for the Martin company is that when you quit, they let you keep your charts. And uh, <laughs> so, <coughs> I, I still have this, this beautiful cover chart. Um, Okay, um, I'm going to talk in some detail about how humans can uh, explore Mars. But before I do, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about how humans have explored the Earth. Because I believe that it is only by looking at how humans have successfully explored on the Earth that you can develop intelligent plans for how humans can explore on uh, Mars. Next slide. So this here uh, is a photograph of one of the great ships in the history of human exploration of the Earth. Okay, this is the Yoa. This is the ship that Captain Amundsen used to do the first successful Northwest Passage. Okay, now, uh, I don't know how well you can see it, it's sort of a dark photograph, but that ship is very small. You can see two people standing next to her. If you cut off her mast and bowsprit, you could put that ship inside the space shuttle payload bay, the entire ship. And yet it is one of the great ships. Okay? Now, in many respects, this mission was a lot like an initial human mission to Mars. First of all, the crew was a crew of six, not 60, not 600, just six, uh, which is comparable to what we might send on an initial pilot mission to Mars. The duration of the mission was three years, which is about what the first round trip to Mars is going to take. Um, the living quarters within the Yoa, and they had to live below decks on the Yoa. Uh, for two long Arctic winters um, within living quarters that are actually smaller than those on the space shuttle, let alone those on any trans-Mars habitat that I or anybody at NASA has, has seriously proposed. Um, so in terms of uh, duration, social space, physical space, this crew took on all the human factors challenges of a, a piloted Mars mission and passed with flying colors. And, and that is interesting. Uh, to a certain amount, because there's been a lot of whining about the human factors barrier to a, a piloted Mars mission. But in fact, it, I believe that if you look at the history of, of exploration uh, of previous generations or of other arduous things that people have done, whether it's soldiers in combat or refugees in hiding or prisoners in prisons, uh, what you find is that the human factors challenge of the piloted Mars mission is, is comparatively modest, and that far from uh, being the um, weakest link in the chain of a piloted Mars mission, the human psyche is likely to be the strongest link in the chain. Okay? And that's 
that's all well and good, but what's so interesting about this beyond that? Well, next chart. The interesting thing here is that while it was the first successful Northwest Passage, it was by no means uh, the first attempt. In fact, there had been over previous attempts, and they all failed. And the interesting thing is that every single one of these over 100 previous attempts were done on a scale, at least a factor of 10, and in some cases a factor of 100, larger than the Amundsen expedition in any measure of mission heft that you might care to propose. That is, for example, the size of the crew, tonnage of the vessels, the amount of money behind the mission, the number of people involved in planning the mission. All the failed missions were at least an order of magnitude larger than the Amundsen expedition, and they all failed. Amundsen was frozen in for two years on King William Island, which is the exact same island in the Canadian Arctic that Sir John Franklin and his two steam frigates and 127 men were frozen in 1847 in one of the 30 British naval Northwest Passage expeditions done during the 19th century alone. Okay? This was a serious affair. Two warships supported by convoys of supply vessels planned several years in advance by the largest planning bureaucracy in the world at the time. Okay? As all the British naval expeditions more or less were. Okay. Anyway, Franklin expedition, frozen in on King William, perished to the man. They ate their way through their 300 tons of salt pork that they had brought along with them. And then they were out of supplies. And so they tried to escape over land, but they couldn't do it. They had no mobility. And they dropped in their tracks, man hauling sledges filled with their valuables. And uh, some of you may actually recall, in the, in the late 1980s, a number of Franklin's men were actually finally dug out of the ice, together with uh, several crates of uh, very fine Victorian china. Um, they had managed to haul with them. Okay. Now, Amundsen was frozen in, in the same place for a longer period of time than it took the Franklin expedition to disintegrate. But he and his men did not starve to death on King William Island. In fact, they got fat, eating caribou, which abound in the area. Because the Amundsen expedition did not go uh, into the Arctic with 300 tons of salt pork. The little Yoa couldn't have carried it, and he couldn't have afforded it. His expedition was actually done on private money. It had to be a pork-free mission. What? <laughs> What they did was they went to the Arctic with half a dozen hunting rifles and several cases of ammunition and men who knew how to use it. Okay? And um, the, uh, they brought something else. They brought dogs and dog sleds. Dogs are, are essential to give you the mobility that is needed to hunt the very mobile herds of caribou that the Amundsen expedition lived off of. And of course, the dogs can be fed off the same resource. And so what this combination allowed Amundsen to do was not only survive, he performed the Northwest Passage on a shoestring, a prize that he had eluded explorers for 400 years since Columbus, okay, but in fact explore. Okay. They did not spend their two Arctic winters, they were frozen in on King William, sitting on the decks of the Yoa, staring at the ice, hoping it would break up. They, they spent their Arctic summers, rather, traveling over land, all over the Arctic via dog sled, hunting, yes, but also exploring. And, and as a result, they made some important discoveries. They discovered that the Earth's magnetic poles move. That's an important discovery in geophysics. It was made by Amundsen, and it was only possible to be made by Amundsen because of this extremely potent travel light and live off the land approach to exploration that they took. So the moral of the story here is, is that if you look at the history of human exploration of the Earth, it has been shown repeatedly, and I, I've given you one example, I can give you many, for instance, Lewis and Clark crossed the American continent with, with 25 men, when previous to them, armies with huge baggage trains had failed to make any significant penetration whatsoever, precisely because of the huge baggage train. Okay? What's been shown, that it's possible for a small group of explorers operating on a shoestring budget to succeed brilliantly in carrying out a program of exploration when numerous others with vastly greater resources behind them had repeatedly failed, provided that a small group makes intelligent use of the resources that are available in the environment they intend to operate in. So how does this relate to space exploration? Next chart. We're here, 1989. President George Bush gets up on the steps of the National Air and Space Museum with Armstrong and Aldrin Collins and Apollo 11 crew flanking him. 
And he says, this is the 20th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. That was great. That's what America is all about. And therefore, I, as president, are committing us to go back to the moon and on to Mars, and this time to stay. It's great stuff. So he started the program that became known as the Space Exploration Initiative. What happened next? NASA, space agency, went off, conducted a study on how this might be accomplished. And they came back three months later with a report that therefore became known as the 90-day report, uh, in which uh, they said, George, we can do it. We can get you to Mars. We require a timeline of 30 years to prepare, and we need a budget of $450 billion. But if you can give us that, we're ready to rock. So this is the sort of thing they came up with, although this particular design I don't think actually is in the 90-day report, but <coughs> to those that are, just a better drawing. Um, okay. um, this is an interplanetary spaceship. I call it the Death Star. <laughs> it weighs a thousand tons, okay, which is um, about the payload the United States has launched cumulatively to orbit since 1975. It's a hundred meters long, big as a football field. It's got one, two, three, four, five big tanks of liquid hydrogen there, each weighing 150 tons. Each of those would have to be launched to orbit separately by a launch vehicle with the capability of a Saturn V moon rocket. That would take about a year to do, in which time a significant fraction of that hydrogen would boil away. But we won't discuss that problem because there are additional problems. Um, for instance, there's two nuclear rocket engines in the rear there, each with 75,000 pounds of thrust. They don't exist. But in addition, what that means is that that truss there, which would have to be built in space, would have to take a load on it, equivalent to a truss standing vertically on the surface of the Earth with 75 cars stacked on top of it. And you'd have to build cryogenic plumbing and electrical connects up and down it. And then there's a, a payload up at the front. Uh, it's kind of complicated. We won't really talk about it, except to notice that it's inside of an aeroshell 100 feet in diameter. So that's too big to sit, fit inside of anybody's uh, launch vehicle fairing. So that would have to be built in space with all the structural integrity uh, that is required of an aeroshell uh, that's going to hit Mars' atmosphere at Mach 30. And in fact, obviously, the whole vehicle would have to be built in space because if you build a launch vehicle big enough to launch that at once, you'd blow away Orlando when it took off. <laughs> would be inconvenient to the local chapter of the National Space Society, <laughs> and bad for NASA public relations. We um, easily wouldn't want to do that. Okay, so next chart. So indeed, it would have to be built in space, and could be, in 10 easy steps, as illustrated here, um, provided that you had available to you a set of orbiting hangars, power stations, construction docks, uh, cryogenic fuel depots, crew construction shacks, checkout points, an entire array of paraphernalia that collectively um, I call the parallel universe. Okay. And, you know, there was the 90 day report. Build the parallel universe, okay, and then you can build the Death Star and, and fly to Mars. And all for a cost less than half that of World War II. Um, now, um, A lot of people in the aerospace industry were aware what was in the 90-day report before it came out. Uh, and certainly the people at Martin were. And um, a number of us engineers went to uh, management and we said, look, uh, this isn't going to work. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of technical reasons we could give you why this wouldn't work, but you wouldn't understand. That. Actually, we left that part out. Uh, okay, you know, but even you, actually, I say it that way, we said, but you can certainly understand that nobody is going to give them $450 billion in 30 years in order to do this. Now, the management of Martin Marietta, as I think most people know, is composed exclusively of brilliant visionaries with lightning quick minds. <laughs> and so um, they said, well, um, let's wait and see. So they waited and they saw, and the 90-day report went down by a, uh, like, a, like a lead balloon in Congress. And so then we had a lot of credibility. And they said to us, well, what do you want to do? And uh, we said, well, what we want to do is we want to put together our own team with a clean sheet of paper, uh, 
uh, allowed to put together our own plan for a human Mars mission. And here's the deal. Okay, we don't want to have a bunch of managers or marketeers or people like this coming in here and telling us we got to design the mission this way or that way. Because we know this guy down at Johnson Space Center or this guy at the Marshall Space Flight Center or some place, you know, who's pushing this technology or that gimcrack, who really wants to see it included in the mission. We really want to make them happy, so we'll include it in the mission. No, because see, in fact, it's that kind of thinking that had what destroyed the 90 day report. The 90 day report was horrible, not because the people who did it were stupid. In fact, individually, the people who did the 90 day report were almost universally extremely intelligent and competent engineers. Okay? The problem was collectively they were a nuthouse. Because what, what they did was they, they ended up designing the most complicated mission they possibly could in order to make everyone's technology mission critical which is exactly the opposite of the correct way to do engineering. So we said, look, we don't want to have that. It's going to be hard enough to develop a competent and practical and low-cost humans to Mars program without being driven by such imperatives. And for certain reasons uh, that, in certain respects, were unique to that particular moment in time, um, they said, OK, you're wrong. So we put together a team of, of people, uh, the scenario development team at Martin Marietta, 12 people from the whole company. I was one of them. Uh, to put together an alternative approach. And because there were a lot of creative spirits on this team, uh, we could not agree with each other. And so we actually ended up devising three plans, and, uh, which could not be reconciled. And we floated all three to NASA in the spring of 1990. And it rapidly became clear that one of these plans, the Mars Direct plan, which I was largely responsible for, along with another fellow named David Baker, um, had the, was, which was by far the most radical departure from this kind of thinking, uh, had the most potential for overthrowing the situation. It was attracting a tremendous amount of support from people who wanted to get to Mars soon, and it was also attracting a lot of opposition from people who were upset with it, either because it left their technologies out of the plan, and therefore, uh, in their view, justified them, or because it was just too different a way to do a Mars mission from how people had been thinking about it up till that time. Um, so uh, I might have a chance to get back to the politics later, but um, rather than that, at this point, I'll simply go on to explain how, in fact, we can get to Mars without a Death Star. Uh, next chart. You don't need a Death Star, but you do need a heavy lift launch vehicle. Heavy lift launch vehicle is not that hard to do. We developed one inside of four years in the 1960s. We can develop one again today. If we wanted to, we could redevelop the Saturn V. But what's more probable today is to develop a heavy lift launch vehicle based on uh, components that are being manufactured today, which is to say shuttle technology. And here's an example of one that we designed called an Ares. It's a junkyard special. Okay? That is, it's made of things that's either in junkyards today or should be. Um, so, what you got there is you got the, the core of it is a shuttle external tank um, without the ogive, which is the conical top on top of the ET today. You don't, you don't need that. Then you got a pod of four space shuttle main engines there near the bottom, offset in that absurd fashion so you can use the shuttle launch pads, okay, which have the flame trenches offset just to that uh, position. Uh, if you, you could get a little more performance by putting them underneath the vehicle, but then you'd have to rearrange the pad. Uh, now those engines are available. In fact, they're lying around in crates near the Rocket Dine factory in Canoga Park, California. And in fact, you can get them for free if you go at night. Because <laughs> no, they're free because they've laid off the night watch when the earthquake went down the fence. It's not really a problem. Um, but then you got uh, two uh, solid rocket boosters, like the shuttle uses. People in Utah will sell those to you. Check the O-rings first. Um, and then you got. Um, a hydrogen oxygen upper stage on top with uh, 250,000 pounds of thrust, which is the same amount of thrust we had in the J2 engines that powered the upper stages of the Saturn V. Uh, that stage does not exist today as an existing integrated piece of hardware, but everything in it does, and we could throw that together pretty quick. And then on top of that, we got a big fat fairing, 10 meters in diameter, so you're not volume constrained uh, very much. Okay. Now, people ordinarily great launch vehicles by what they can lift to low Earth orbit, or LEO. If you want to know, an Ares can lift 121 metric tons to low Earth orbit, which is pretty good. 
Uh, it's much more than the shuttle, which could do 20 or 22. Um, it's even more than a Russian Energia, which could do 100. It's a little less than a Saturn V, which could do 140. But it's basically in the Saturn V class. Uh, and like the Saturn V, and unlike, for example, the space shuttle, this booster has an additional capability. Because it is a staged vehicle, it can use that upper stage to throw payloads far beyond low Earth orbit, to throw them directly into interplanetary space. We can throw 47 tons on a straight trajectory to Mars, or 59 to the moon. And you see, that's the way we want to do a Mars mission if we want to do it in our lifetimes. Lift and throw. Send the payload to Mars in the same way we've sent every real unmanned interplanetary payload to Mars, or, or frankly, anywhere else beyond low Earth orbit. Okay, just throw it there with the upper stage of the same booster that lifted it to Leo. Now, see, and, and, and if you can understand one thing, what a human to Mars mission is about <coughs> is not about realizing the vision of the giant interplanetary spaceship. What is it is about is sending a package to Mars, uh, sending a payload to Mars capable of supporting a small group of people, and then sending either that or an analogous payload back. So it's not about creating spaceships, it's about sending packages. Okay? If you can make that mental switch, you are in fact 80% of the way to Mars right there. Okay? Now, but how could you do it? Okay? The Aries can only lift 120 tons to Leo. The Death Star weighed 1,000. Okay? What can you do? As I said, we don't want to build a super booster and it would kill Mike Gilbrook. Okay. The, um, okay. What we, we, well, we could split the mission up. 1,000 by 120 is 8. So we'd send off 8 payloads to Mars and convoy, rendezvous along the way in various places and orbits. Well, maybe, but if you did that, um, uh, it would be an extremely high risk way to do the mission because you've got 8 rockets, they're all launching payloads that are mission critical, and one goes to the drink, you've lost the whole mission. Well, we can, uh, but we can split it into a smaller number, say two pieces. I'd be willing to bet on two launches both working in order to do my Mars mission, and in fact, I do. Uh, but that would still leave 500 tons a shot. Well, what else could you do? Well, the 90-day report mission used a trajectory which in my view was irrational. It was called the opposition class trajectory. And um, the opposition class trajectory involves very large propulsion requirements, very large delta Vs, in order to achieve a trajectory which is, um, in a sense, unnatural. Uh, and what the opposition trajectory does do is it accomplishes what NASA at that time adopted as their figure of merit for a human Mars mission, which was minimum time away from Earth. With an opposition class trajectory, you take about 1.8 years to fly to Mars and back in two legs of unequal length, and you spend uh, less than a month at Mars. If the weather is bad, you don't even get to land. Okay? So you're spending a little less than two years round trip, and 5% of the mission time is spent at Mars, and um, with very high delta Vs that increase the mass of the mission. There's another kind of trajectory, which is actually an older concept, called the conjunction class trajectory, in which, uh, if you do it right, you spend six months going to Mars, a year and a half on the surface, and six months coming back. So you are away from home for a longer period of time. You're away from home for two and a half years. But 60% of your mission time is being spent on Mars, okay? Not 5%, okay? And since it, my figure of merit for a human Mars mission is person days on Mars divided by tons in low Earth orbit. I regard time spent on Mars as a positive product of the mission, not as a negative. After all, we are going to Mars in order to spend time on Mars exploring the planet. Okay? I mean, if, if minimum time away from Earth is your figure of merit, just don't go. Okay? The, um... So, uh, uh, Anyway, if you adopt the conjunction class uh, concept, then, um, the mass of the mission would drop from around um, 1,000 tons to around 600 tons with that particular design. Divide that in half, that's 300 tons each. Uh, still too much for an Aries, but we're almost in the realm of, of the possible. What else could you do? Well, you could invoke advanced propulsion. Nuclear propulsion. Ion drives. Fusion propulsion. How about antimatter? Warp drive. 
There's teleportation. Pixie dust. There's a whole range of alternatives out there, okay? And some of them offer tremendous mission advantages. Um, unfortunately, as they become increasingly capable, they become decreasingly probable. Um, now, some of those will work. Nuclear propulsion will certainly work someday. Ion drives will certainly work someday. But there's a problem. And the problem is this. The problem is that the fundamental problem facing the Humans to Mars program is the same problem of that facing the children of Israel in attempting to cross the Red Sea. Okay, here's what I mean. In other words, look, you've got this big obstacle you want to get across. Okay, it's impossible. But then a miracle happens. Moses parts the waters. Bush gives a speech. Now you've got these two cliffs of water standing there with a path of dry land in between. Okay, you can get across. But you can't do that on a 30-year timeline. Because the Egyptians are behind you. And you know, God's patience is not infinite. And, and the US Congress is worse. The, you know, you got these two cliffs of water standing here. If you try to take 30 years to go across, you know, pretty soon the special effects budget runs out. Okay. Um, you know, so much. Okay. DeMille goes on to another movie. The um, so in other words, if John F. Kennedy in 1961 had said, I want to have humans to the moon by 1990 instead of by 1970, which of course is what he actually did say, then by 1968 we would have been in the middle of the Mercury flights and we'd have a new administration, next administration would be in the Vietnam War, the national mood was totally different from that than it was in the early 60s, and the program would have been canceled. And people today would be saying that going to the moon was an impossible dream. That it, it was just this, this flaky thing that this, you know, boy president thought of it. It just was never going to happen. Okay. No, if you want to go to Mars, you cannot do it in 30 years. You cannot do it in 20 years. If you want to go to Mars, you've got to do it in 10 years or less, or you're guaranteeing that the waters are going to come together on you. And what does that mean as far as propulsion is concerned? What that means is that you've got to adopt as your form of propulsion the kind of propulsion that's either on the shelf right now, ready to be used, or very close to it. Because if you posit some futuristic propulsion scheme, however wonderful it might be, okay, um, you are guaranteeing the waters are going to come together on you before you ever get close. So, if we rule out futuristic propulsion, what else can we do? Adopt the Amundsen approach. Reduce the mass that we have to send to Mars by using the mass that is already there. So, how does this work in, in practice? Next chart. Okay, here's a mission sequence chart for the Mars direct mission. Now you have a chance to launch payloads to Mars every other year. For example, 2001, 2003, 2005, 2007. Okay. Um, at this point, um, realistically speaking, year one could be 2005, year three could be 2007, and so forth. Uh, if we were to get started in a serious way right now. Okay. Um, so, how does it work? In a given year, say 2005, year number one, we launch one of these boosters off the Cape. And we use that upper stage to throw a payload to Mars weighing around 40 metric tons. And there's no one in it. Okay? And it flies to Mars, it takes eight months to get there on a minimum energy trajectory. And then when it gets there, it uses its aero shield to aero capture and to orbit around Mars. Then we check it out, and we check out the weather, and then we bring it into the atmosphere for, for real, and bring it down and, and land it on Mars with parachutes and retro rockets, just like we did uh, with the Viking lander in 1976. Now, what is this thing that we've landed on Mars? Next chart, but save this one, we'll need it again. It consists of a number of things. The primary object is a Earth return vehicle, or ERV, okay, which is uh, depicted here. Okay. Uh, the ERV is a little rocket ship. It's got a small cabin with suitable quarters, Spartan quarters, for a crew of four uh, for a six-month transit from Mars back to Earth later on in the mission, but no one's in it now. Then underneath it, we got two methane-oxygen chemical propulsion stages, which, however, are unfueled. If they were fueled, this thing would weigh four times as much as it does and be much too heavy for Aries to throw it to Mars. However, in some of the lower-stage tanks that are later going to contain methane, We've got around six tons of liquid hydrogen, probably in gelled form. 
And then below the vehicle, not shown in this picture, we got a little light truck, like a little um, uh, pickup truck that runs on a methane oxygen internal combustion engine. And in the back of that truck, we got a little nuclear reactor with a power of 100 kilowatts, which is like 130 horsepower. So it's a little putt putt nuke sitting in the back of the truck. And then you land this thing on the ground, and then you telerobotically drive the truck a few hundred yards away from the landing site, unwinding a cable off the back of it as you go. You gotta drive real slow because there's a time lag and radio signals from Earth to Mars, but you're not going far and you got a big wheel vehicle. And then you put the reactor on the ground, preferably in some little crater or a ditch or something, uh, or just on the reverse side of the hill, anything to put a nice nice chunk of dirt between it and the main landing area. And then you turn the reactor on, and now you've got power of the ship. And what you do then is you go hunting for Martian caribou. Next slide. Otherwise known as carbon dioxide molecules. There's herds of them on Mars. The, uh, in fact, Mars has got an atmosphere which is 95% CO2. We know that for a fact because of the uh, two Viking landers that operated on Mars uh, for four and six years respectively in the uh, late 1970s. Okay? Now, what you do is you run a pump and you suck in that CO2. And CO2 can be reacted with the hydrogen that you brought from Earth in the presence of a catalyst to produce methane and water. Okay? Uh, methane is natural gas, it's great rocket fuel, you store that in your tank. The water you condense out and you electrolyze into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen you oxidize it or burn the methane with, you store that in your other tank and the hydrogen you recycle to make more methane and water and round and round you go. And if you just ran those two reactions, you turn six tons of hydrogen into 72 tons of methane oxygen on the surface of Mars. That's, that's a leverage of um, 12 to 1, but you can do better than that because um, the ideal mixture ratio for burning these two uh, propellants requires more oxygen. So you run a third reactor in which you take in some CO2 and you break it down into carbon monoxide and oxygen. You keep the oxygen and you vent the monoxide. You can do that on Mars. There is no EPA there. And, <laughs> and when you're all done, you've taken your six tons of hydrogen and you've turned it into 108 tons of methane oxygen on the uh, surface of Mars. It's a leverage of 18 to 1. It's like being able to buy gasoline for seven cents a gallon. Okay, or to stick closer to our analogy, it's like a pioneer being able to acquire the useful mass of a bison for the transported mass of several bullets and cartridges. And that's what makes the whole mission sink. 95% of your return propellant is coming from Mars, only 5% of it in the way of feedstock had to come from Earth. And because we can make so much propellant, we not only make enough to fuel the Earth return vehicle, we make around 10% extra, an extra 12 tons, which can be used to power the ground vehicle. Okay. We're going to explore Mars with ground vehicles powered by internal combustion or gas turbine engines, okay, because they have a much higher power to mass ratio than you can ever get with a battery powered vehicle or a fuel cell or an RTG powered vehicle. Okay? And that's the dog sled. And that's important too, because we're not going to Mars, okay, just to say we did it. We're not going to Mars, you know, to set a new altitude record for the aviation almanac. Okay. We're, we're going to Mars to explore a planet, and mobility on the surface is the most important thing that you can possibly have, and combustion-powered vehicles is what's going to give that to you. But it's not practical to use combustion-powered vehicles on the surface of Mars if you have to bring the fuel from Earth. But we can make it there, we can use them, so we can not only get to Mars cheaply, we can be potent once we're there. Okay, next slide. Now, um, you know, frequently it's pretty easy to write a bunch of chemical equations on a, on a piece of paper, and another thing uh, entirely to do it in practice, that is not the case here, okay? Um, because uh, we actually, at, at Martin, uh, this is at Martin Marietta, uh, built a machine that does the chemical synthesis that uh, I just described to you here. Um, the, what you're looking at here is a full-scale unit, not for the man Mars mission, but for a Mars sample return mission, that we built at Martin on a budget of $47,000, which was provided by Johnson Space Center. And David Kaplan, who's sitting right over there, was the Johnson program manager on that. We built this uh, 47 k at Martin Marietta. I don't know if we've ever built anything else for 47 k at Martin Marietta. Uh, but we built this, we built it inside of three months, and it was 94% efficient. Uh, and not a single person on this program, not me, not Larry Clark, the test engineer shown there, or anyone else working on this was actually a real chemical engineer or just aerospace engineers thinking around. 
So, you know, if we can make this work, real chemical engineers can make it work even sweeter. It works, okay? That's all there is to it. In fact, it's, it's really just 19th century chemical engineering. Um, and that while, you know, sometimes um, some people criticize me and say, oh, of course your Mars mission plan is cheap and looks good. You're, you're doing a miracle. You're making rocket fuel out of the air. It's the easiest thing in the whole mission. Making rocket fuel with these kinds of chemical engineering enemies is a much easier thing than, for instance, building a launch vehicle that can go to Earth orbit, or guiding something through interplanetary space, or doing aerial capture at Mars, or doing a soft landing on Mars. Okay? This is a much lower level technology. This is the only part of a manned Mars mission that you can do at home. Okay. All right. Uh, go back to the mission sequence chart. So, it took eight months for that thing to get to Mars. It took 10 months to make the propellant. That's 18 months. There's 26 months in between launch windows from Earth to Mars. So long before the next launch window has opened up, you will know that you have a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for you on the surface of Mars. And that being the case, at the next launch window, year number three, 2007, we launched two more boosters off the Cape. One shoots out another one of these Earth return vehicle fuel factory deals. The other one shoots out a habitat with a crew of four astronauts in it. Okay, next chart, let's save this one. Okay. Now, you see, look, we've got our return ride waiting for us on Mars. So we do not need to fly to Mars in the Death Star. We don't need even to fly to Mars in the Millennium Falcon. We can fly to Mars in a tuna can. <laughs> and and, and that's good, because we know how to make tuna cans. And they've been proven in commerce to be in an extremely efficient shape for packaging purposes. Okay, of course, we need one a little larger than the standard chicken of the sea model. This one is 16 feet tall and 27 feet in diameter, so it's got two decks, each with eight feet of headroom. The upper deck is where the people actually live. The lower deck is more of a garage, cargo hold, uh, workshop kind of area. Uh, next chart. This shows the upper deck of the ham. There's a little stateroom for each of the four astronauts. Uh, there's a science area, an exercise area, a galley. And in the center of it, there's a solar flare storm shelter. Okay? Now, there's been a lot made about radiation in interplanetary space. There's two kinds of radiation that can get you in interplanetary space. There's solar flares and there's cosmic rays. And they're very different from each other. Solar flares are events that occur in an unpredictable way, but do with a frequency on the order of one a big one a year that in the course of several hours can deliver a flood of radiation coming out of the sun of several thousand grams, which is enough to kill an unshielded astronaut either immediately or after a, reason, or after a short period of radiation sickness. Um, okay, and that's bad. Um, however, the good news is that the kind of radiation that solar flares are made out of are protons with energies of about a million volts and they can be stopped by five inches of water, or things that from a nuclear point of view are fundamentally the same as water, such as food, or things that water and food become as the mission proceeds. Um, <laughs> and this stuff is all very good shielding material, and you have enough of it on board that if you pack it in around the limited area of the ship, in this case in the center, okay, you can make a pantry storm shelter. That stuff can shield you. So if a solar flare happens, the alarm bell rings, you go in the storm shelter, and you're safe. You're packed in there like commuters on the New York subway for a few hours, except that you won't have panhandlers coming through. If you do, you have another problem. Um, <laughs> um, but um, you're, you're, you're packed in there um, and uh, you know for, for three, four, five hours, and you come out, and it's over. Okay? And you're only going to have to do this once or twice in the whole mission. Okay? You know, which is a lot better than, you know, I had to put up with them. I was teaching in New York. I had to do it every day. Um, okay, now the other kind of radiation that can get you in, in, in space uh, is cosmic rays. Okay, now these are particles. They don't come from the sun. They come from somewhere in interstellar space. No one, in fact, really even knows where they come from. And they're particles that come zooming in with energies not of millions of volts, but billions of volts. Thousands of times more energy, particle for particle, than solar flare particles. So you can't stop them with a few inches of water. You would need several meters of water, or its equivalent in mass, to stop cosmic ray particles. And we can't take that kind of weight with us on a Mars mission. So you're going to take the dose. Okay, that's bad. 
The good news, however, is that the magnitude of that dose is not that great. It's around 50 rem a year for every year you're in space in the Earth-Mars region of the solar system. Okay? And, you know, 50 rem, and you're, that's what you're going to be, because you're going to be six months out and six months out. That represents slightly less than a 1% risk of getting a fatal cancer at some point later in your life, assuming no advance in current medical technique. Okay? Um, now, that's, that's, that's bad. Uh, but on the other hand, right now, assuming you do not smoke, you have a 20% chance of dying of, 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 of cancer at some point later in your life. Okay? Uh, and this would make it move it from 20 to 21. If you smoke, it actually increases it to 40. So if you recruited the crew out of smokers <laughs> and sent them to Mars without their tobacco, you would be reducing their chance. <laughs> So, uh, one reason to send people to Mars would be for their health. I'm supposed to go to Mars. Okay. <laughs> there you go. We have one, one person saved, right? Uh, okay. Now, the other thing you'll notice about this habitat is that, in a, one respect, it's a very conventional design. We got a table and chairs on the floor, we got a shelf, we got a sink. This thing is designed for use in a gravity environment. And indeed, we're going to land it on Mars, or we're going to use it as our house on Mars, and of course there's gravity on Mars, 38% down of Earth. Uh, and on the way to Mars, we're going to make gravity. Next chart. By spinning up. Okay? Uh, see that thing on the, the left? That's the burned out upper stage of the Ares booster that threw us to Mars. So it's also sailing off to Mars. Now it's out of gas, it's a piece of junk. But we can still use it as a counterweight on the end of the tether and spin that thing up. That tether's one mile long. We spin that up one RPM, we get Mars normal gravity inside the hab. If we spin it two RPM, it would only have to be about 350 yards. And either of those spin rates would involve very low um, Coriolis forces and so forth. And the idea of, of spinning it to have to make gravity is to avoid the uh, deleterious effects of zero G on the health that had been shown in repeated long-duration flights to the cosmonauts in the 1980s and, and 1990s. Uh, now, however, since this mission design was developed, we have a new data point. Can I have the next chart? Which is the Shannon Lucid flight. Okay. Shannon Lucid, American astronaut, flew on the Mir last year for six months, which is as long as it takes to fly from Earth to Mars. Okay. Now, she, you know, the cosmonauts have been up there six months, comparable periods. They come off, they have to be taken off on stretchers. Shannon walked off the shuttle, and here she is walking around Johnson Space Center the day after she landed. This picture is taken the day after Shannon landed. She's walking around JSC, shaking hands with Bill Clinton and Dan Golden, and she's still not sick. So, what's the deal here? How did she pull this off? Okay. The way the press reported it was, boy, that gal has moxie, and indeed, she does. I won't deny that for a second, but that's not how she did it. She did it by doing the zero-g countermeasures, which involved an hour and 20 minutes of very hard exercises a day, every day while she was in orbit. Okay, and she came out and she walked off the shuttle in acceptable condition to do things, even walking out right out into a 1G gravity field instead of the one-third gravity field that she would have had to walk out into if she arrived on Mars. Okay? It turns out that the Russian cosmonauts never implemented their zero-G countermeasures. They're undisciplined, they don't do the exercises, and in fact they drink a lot on orbit. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, so, the data that we got that zero-g countermeasures don't work turned out to be false. They do work. However, my own personal preference, because I hate doing exercises, is to have artificial G on the spaceship. Uh, anyway, but the point is, if you wanted to go zero-g, you can, Shannon Lucid, prove that. Okay? Uh, or we can go the other way. Uh, let's go back to that mission sequence chart. Uh, slide person here. Okay, change in personnel. All right, so it takes six months for them to fly to Mars. They get close to Mars, they fire a pyro bolt, get rid of the, the tether in the upper stage, the aero capture to orbit around Mars, and then they go land at site number one where a fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for them. Now, 
We've been on the ground at site number one for two years. We thoroughly explore the areas with little robotic rovers, taking pictures of everything that's going to be used to train the pilots to do in the landing. We've got a radar beacon on the ground to draw them in. We've got an ace flying in that thing. We should be able to land right on the spot. X marks the spot where there. Okay, and I think people here probably recall that during Apollo, we actually landed an Apollo lunar lander within 200 yards of a surveyor spacecraft that had been put on the moon uh, some time prior. Uh, and we have much better guidance systems today, so we should be able to hit it. But let's say we don't. Let's say we land 10, 20, 30 miles away. That would be very big, large landing errors. We're still okay. Because we have with us, in the lower deck of the half, a pressurized ground roving vehicle about the size of a 4x4. It runs on a methane oxygen internal combustion engine and it, it has a one-way driving range of 600 miles. So it would take really piss-poor piloting <laughs> to land outside the radius of action of that vehicle. Okay. But let's say that happens. Let's say they land on the wrong side of the planet. <laughs> Which, yeah. Russian? No. Um, <laughs> this would represent a, a real problem with the pilot selection process at Johnson Space Center if this would occur. Okay. If it did occur, okay, you're still okay because you got the second Earth return vehicle following you out to Mars. And if you did land way off course, that one could be land, brought down to land near you wherever you did land, and that one would be done accurately because it'd be automated. Now, in that event, you would be depending upon the chemical synthesis process to work you know, real time instead of past tense, which is the basis of the mission plan. But the chemical synthesis gear has already been proven by the success of the first lander. Um, and uh, we have a human crew on the scene to adjust the chemical synthesis gear should it malfunction. Of course, you probably would not want the pilot to be involved in those <laughs> operations. Uh, and it is a third level mission backup. And finally, as a fourth level mission back up here, the fact of the matter is we got the entire crew landed on Mars, where they got natural gravity, where they got substantial radiation protection, and they got enough supplies with them to last for three years. Okay? So if worse comes to worse, they just tough it out on the surface of Mars until more supplies and another Earth return vehicle can be fired out to them at the next launch window. Okay, so what we have here is a four layer defense in depth on the mission, and each layer involves actually carrying off the mission. We do have one aboard option, okay, which is as you're approaching Mars, if you don't want to go in, you can do what's called a free return. You come back to Earth two years after you left it, arrow captured to orbit, and get picked up by the shuttle. But that's basically tangential to the main. The main mission logic is not aboard options. It's backup plans. It's more akin to military thinking of a, a, a series of tactical options, a main option and various contingency plans, but they all involve taking the beach because the landing craft are not about to go backward. Okay? And th this is one important difference between Mars missions and lunar missions. In Apollo, they were prepared to abort Apollo up to seconds before the actual lunar landing. Okay? You can't do that on Mars missions. You're much more committed the minute you're on trans-Mars injection. So you, you don't arrange your mission in abort option logic, you arrange it in backup plan logic. And, and, and that's what we do here. But let's say it works the way it's supposed to work. You land at site number one, the Earth return vehicle checks out, you kick the tires, it's in great shape. What do you do with the second Earth return vehicle? You land it somewhere else, site number two, okay, which could be anywhere, but I recommend a few hundred miles away. Why? Because that is a new place where people can explore, but it is within the long range driving range of your available ground transportation. So that if worse comes to worse, the crew has available to them two complete Earth return vehicles, either one of which can get them home, and they have three sets of living quarters that they can live in, the big one in the half, and two smaller ones in the cabins of the Earth return vehicles. Okay. But the, the main purpose, of course, of the second Earth return vehicle is to land at site number two, where it starts making propellant, which will be used to support flying out there in 2009, the crew of mission number two, along with another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, but which otherwise is used to open up site number three. So the idea here is that every other year we launch two boosters off the Cape, one to open up a new site, one to exploit the previous site. Two boosters every two years is an average of one per year to support a continuous program of human exploration of Mars. And if we could do that, if we could launch these things at the same rate we launch the shuttles, which is at least six a year, you're talking about using 16% of your available heavy lift capability to support human Mars exploration. And that is something this country can easily afford to do. Next chart.
So this, by the way, is an actual photograph <laughs> okay, of the human Mars base. Okay, um, the conical uh, spacecraft is the Earth return vehicle. Okay, and the uh, chemical plant is right built right into its landing stage at the bottom. The reactors in the crater in the background. Tuna can have up uh, on the left. Uh, a set of photovoltaics over on the far left that they bring with them in the uh, hab in case they have landed too far away from the reactor to use its power. They want to have enough power with them to support their own uh, life support system, which you can do with photovoltaics. There's the 4x4 four four size the ground rover over there. Uh, runs on the methane oxygen engine. Uh, by the way, the uh, photovoltaics obviously are a backup source of power for the base in case you are powered by the reactor, you can turn it off. And a third source of backup power is the engine on the rover, which can run on the uh, methane oxygen fuel and turn a generator and make power either at the base or at a distance from the base. So you have mobile power to do energy intensive science at a distance from the base. You can run a strong ground penetrating radar off the rover to look for subsurface water because if there's life on Mars, that's where you're going to find it. Okay, or to drill, run a drilling rig to, to try to reach that water and access it. Then on the other large object there is an inflatable greenhouse. Uh -huh. okay, that's an experiment. It's not a mission critical item, but they're learning how to grow food on Mars, both for the benefit of future missions and the benefit of future colonists. Okay, now, the, um, we made 10 extra tons of methane oxygen okay, to support the ground rover. Okay. Uh, assuming you do not condense the water out of the exhaust to that engine, which you could do, which would allow you to extend it, the methane oxygen much further, um, that's still enough to drive that thing 24,000 kilometers, 16,000 miles, okay, which is an average of 32 miles away a day of driving. That's a fair amount of exploratory capability that you get by uh, using the um, uh, indigenous produced uh, propellant. Okay. Now what are we going to explore for? We're going to explore Mars to find the answers to two questions. The first question is to find the answer to was there or is there life on Mars? Okay, there are various secondary questions that various people are interested in, but that's the fundamental question number one. Okay, see, look, everybody here, unless you were on Mars last summer, heard about the uh, Mars rocks, the Martian meteorites that were revealed to the public would show uh, a strong amount of evidence uh, for life on Mars in the distant past. Although I, I would say not conclusive proof, I'd say the evidence in those rocks is, is pretty strong. Um, the, um, but even without those rocks, um, next chart, is that a gray one with, uh, no, skip it, keep the other one on, I, I guess the other one in the chart. Even before that rock was discovered, there was strong evidence uh, for a possibility of life on Mars from the water erosion features that are visible on the surface of Mars that we photographed from orbit, um, which show that Mars was once a warm and wet planet. And in fact, the geologic evidence is that Mars was a warm and wet planet for its first billion years as a planet, which is a longer period of time than it took life to appear in the fossil record on Earth. And show that, so if the theory is correct, that life, the evolution of life, is a natural development wherever you have water rich uh, in a, a, a temperate uh, conditions for an extended period of time, then life should have appeared on Mars, even if it subsequently went extinct uh, when the Martian uh, climate deteriorated. And if we can go to Mars and explore Mars and find fossils of life on Mars, what we will have proven is not that just there's life on Mars, we'll have proven the universe is alive. Because you will have proven that the, the processes that lead to the development of life are of high probability. And since every star has a certain root distance from it, near or far, depending upon the dimness or brightness of the star, which has got the appropriate temperatures for liquid water, and since it's now becoming apparent that planetary systems are common, uh, what that means is that when you look up into the night sky and see a million uh, points of light, you're looking at a million inhabited worlds. On the other hand, if we go to Mars and do substantial field exploration and find that um, uh, yeah, it was a warm and wet planet for a billion years, and we find all this water erosion depositions and so forth, but no evidence whatsoever for the development of life. Then that could say something else entirely about the processes that lead to the development of life. It could, it could say that there's an element of free chance uh, in, in the origin of life, and we could be completely alone in the entire universe. Okay? So it's a question of immense philosophical importance, and it can only be solved by human exploration on Mars. Okay? Because you, you, can't, you cannot do fossil hunting with toy cars. 
Okay? I mean, ro sending robotic rovers to Mars is a very good thing, and it's much better than no mission at all. Don't get me wrong. I'm entirely in favor of robotic missions to Mars, and the more the merrier. However, you got to understand that fossil hunting requires human capabilities. It requires hiking long distances through unimproved terrain. It requires climbing up steep hillsides. It requires hard work, heavy work, dig digging and pickaxe work. It requires delicate work, splitting open fossil shales, which are like books of rocks that have been pasted together and that you have to peel the pages apart very carefully to reveal the fossils that are inside. Okay. These capabilities are far beyond uh, that of, of, of robotic rovers. And in fact, if one you know, delivered, you, know, you take a rover like the Sojourner that we're landing on Mars this summer, which is a great advance. It's the first thing we're sending to Mars that can move at all. And yet, you know, it's a toy car, two feet long with wheels six inches in diameter. It cannot climb over a rock one foot high. You know, you could parachute a hundred of them into the Rocky Mountains. You'd never find a dinosaur fossil. Okay, if you put one of those at a paleontological dig on Earth, people would use it to put the coffee cups on it. The, uh, <laughs> The, uh, it, it does not compare to human explorers. So if we're serious about finding this thing, the answer to this question of life on Mars, we're going to have to send people. Okay. Uh, now, they're going to be on Mars for a year and a half, and at the end of that time, they get in the Earth return vehicle, they put the key in the ignition, start her up, and take off and fly home directly to Earth. Okay. They leave the habitat behind on Mars. They leave the reactor. Okay. The, the soap photovoltaics, the rovers, the greenhouse. Is that bad? No. We don't want to bring all this stuff back from Mars. We have a lot of stuff right here, right now. The, okay. the idea of Mars missions, it's not the same as single stage to orbit where you want to get your spaceship back. The idea of Mars missions is to deliver as much stuff to Mars as you can and come back with as little as you can. Next chart. As a series of missions unfolds, Okay, this depicts what you might have as a pattern of landing sites scattered across the Martian surface. Okay, um, each of those uh, circles in the center of the circles is where the landings are, and the radius of the circles defines the radius of action of the uh, ground rover. And you can see that each of those missions can explore an area about the size of, of, of the state of Texas. Okay, however, and, and so it. it you can see how impotent you would be in terms of exploring a significant fraction of Mars if the radius of action of your vehicle was a quarter of what it is with a combustion-powered rover. Those circles would be tiny. Even at their current size, you only have to explore a small fraction of Mars. Okay. But this is what you've done. You've set up a string of warming huts. You can drive from one to the other and continue to use uh, previously landed bases. Uh, you've opened up contiguous human territory on a fair scale on Mars. However, after a series of these questions, a series of these missions, rather, have transpired, the fundamental question about Mars is going to shift to question number two, which is not, was there or is there life on Mars? Ultimately, the more important question dealing with Mars is question number two, which is, will there be life on Mars? May I have the next chart? You see, Mars Mars is not just an object of scientific inquiry. It's not just an object out there for some professors to write articles in the Journal of Geophysical Research about and get tenure. Okay? It is a world. Okay? It is a planet with a surface area equal to all the continents of Earth combined, and it has on it all the resources that are needed to support not just life, but someday a new branch of human civilization. Okay? It has on it, yes, the elements of life. It's got carbon and oxygen, in the form of carbon dioxide, and also water, hydrogen and oxygen, and it's got water in the soil. It's currently believed on the basis of geological evidence that if Mars was smoothed, okay, and you melted all the water out of the permafrost, you'd have enough water on Mars to put the whole planet under an ocean 600 feet deep. Okay? Now that is dry compared to the Earth. If the Earth was smooth, it would be under 6,000 feet of water. Okay? Because the Earth is a water world. But it is comparable to the freshwater inventory of the Earth. Okay? It is more than enough water to support not only a little base, but an entire biosphere. Okay? The, uh, there's also nitrogen on Mars. It's the minority constituent to the atmosphere, and it's probably nitrates in the soil, because that's the only way that people can explain where the initial nitrogen uh, went. Okay? So you've got 
nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, all in the forms that life is prepared to use. And this is very different from the moon. Okay? okay? Barring the possibility of frozen water in one permanently dark crater at the moon's south pole, which may or may not be verified this fall, okay, the moon is extremely dry. It is so dry it makes the Sahara look like a swamp. The moon is so dry in its bulk that if there were concrete on the moon, lunar colonists would mine it to get the water out. And there is no carbon or nitrogen on the moon, okay? Which means that on the moon, in a lunar colony, human excrement would be more valuable than gold. Okay? So that in comparison to Mars, it's extremely poor. But Mars has these resources. And it has not only these resources, it has a 24-hour day, okay? It has light and dark that comes on in 24-hour periods, which is exactly what plants require. They cannot tolerate two weeks of light, two weeks of dark. Okay? The, uh, and what does that mean? That means you can grow food on Mars in greenhouses lit by natural sunlight, which is extremely important because the amount of energy it takes to grow crops, if you try to do it with electricity, is prohibitive. Okay? A single square kilometer of crops on Earth uses a thousand megawatts of electricity. Okay, a thousand megawatts of, of sunlight. If you had to provide that with electricity, it would be a thousand megawatts of electricity. Okay, which means, okay, that for instance, the amount of crops grown in El Salvador, okay, the agricultural giant of the world, uh, requires more sunlight, uh, more energy than the entire human race currently uses and produces in its electric power. So you cannot develop a civilization based on electrically grown crops. You've got to use natural sunlight. And Mars is unique, in, in, aside from the Earth, in having a, a solar cycle which corresponds to this. In addition to this, Mars has the elements of industry. It has calcium and phosphorus and sulfur, okay, and silicon and iron and titanium and aluminum, okay, and everything. And it's got the geological processes that are required to produce mineral ore. Okay, in hydrologic and volcanic and possibly even biologic processes required to produce mineral ore have occurred on Mars. So that everything you need to not only grow food but produce things okay, of every sort needed by civilization exists on Mars. And if we can go to Mars and develop the craft of using those things, okay, if we can learn how to go beyond what Mars Direct is the first step, we make fuel and oxygen out of the most obvious resource on Mars, its atmosphere, it's kind of the hunter-gatherer level, level of planetary utilization. We go beyond that, okay, to learn how to extract water from the Martian soil, or better yet, drill underground and extract geothermally heated water and get power as well, and grow crops, and learn how to make bricks and ceramics and glasses and plastics and metals and wires and tubes and habitats. If we develop that craft, we turn Mars into a habitable world. Okay? See, resources. What is a resource? The thing that determines whether something is or is not a resource is dependent not so much on the passive material, it's dependent upon what you have up here. Okay? What do I mean by that? Two people can be stranded in the woods. One can starve to death inside of two weeks. The other can live there indefinitely in relative comfort. Why? Because one can see the resources that are there and knows how to use them. Okay. Similarly, if we can go to Mars and learn the craft of how to turn all these raw materials that exist on Mars into useful objects, by doing that, okay, by effecting that mental transformation in the human race, we change Mars into a habitable planet. Now someday, when there are large numbers of people on Mars, we will go way beyond that. We will physically transform Mars. Because Mars was once a warm and wet planet and can be made so again by human industrial and technical capability. It can be done once we have a large number of people uh, existing on Mars. But long before that comes about, we can transform Mars intellectually into a habitable planet by learning how to inhabit it. And that is the purpose of a, a, a Martian base. And that is how we answer question number two. After a certain number of these missions have occurred, we start landing the halves, not scattered all over the place, because after a certain number of the missions have occurred, we'll have answered question number one, one way or the other. We'll have done a lot of field exploration. We'll continue to do field exploration, but we'll have gotten pretty much 
to the bottom of, 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 of that question in the broad outline. Uh, and we'll move on. So what you do is you start landing a lot of the halves all in the same area. Okay? And you made them up. Okay? You, you can't really land the halves with two feet of clearance between them coming down on rocket engines that tight. It would be kind of dicey. But you can land them a few hundred yards apart and move them together and made them up. Okay? One way to do it would be to have halves, halves attach wheels to each leg and cable and a windlass and roll them together. And that would probably work pretty good. But another way to do it would be to have second generation halves whose landing gear can articulate not only up and down, but uh, as all landing gear must, but also side to side. And given the fact that the halves have six legs, this would allow them to walk, much as the Martians did in the War of the Worlds. And uh, so that technique has heritage on Mars and is therefore <laughs> um, depicted here. Okay. And uh, so we just can develop a Martian base that way. Um, I'm going to ask you to zoom ahead to the second to last, uh, third to last chart. Um, it shows a lunar base. I know I'm running low on time, so I won't go into it. Um, I don't agree with those people who say the moon is a stepping stone to Mars. It's not a good place to launch Mars missions from. The delta V to go to the surface of the moon from, this, from low Earth orbit is actually greater than that to go there, uh, to go directly to the surface of Mars. So even if you had rocket fuel sitting waiting for you in tanks on the surface of the moon with a free car wash, um, it would not pay to go there from LEO to refuel on your way to Mars. Okay, so it just is not true that the moon is, is a stepping stone to Mars. However, the moon is a good place to go to do astronomy from its world class for that purpose. And um, it makes a lot of sense if you're developing hardware to go to Mars that you uh, also design it in such a way that it allows you to set up astronomical observatories on the moon. And in the case of, of the Mars Direct Plan, that is, is certainly uh, the case as well. But I, I won't describe the plan because it's a talk in itself. Um, but um, I believe that if we, we set our sights on Mars, if we create a Humans to Mars program, we will pick up the moon as a byproduct, just as we created a space station easily as an afterthought in the wake of the Apollo program. We went to the moon, we developed the capability to launch big things to Earth orbit, we created Skylab in an afternoon. And similarly, if we set our sights on Mars, we'll pick up the moon as well. Next chart. No, not that. We're, we're going to be near the end here. In other words, skip all the way towards the last uh, two charts, uh, three charts. Get, get rid of all the charts that are in between. Okay. So, to summarize, this is the complete set of tools that you need to establish human beings on the moon and Mars in, in the coming period. You need a good heavy lift booster with a good throw stage that can throw payloads to either the moon or Mars. Okay, you don't need any giant interplanetary spaceships or giant interplanetary spaceports. Then you got two fundamental payload elements, half modules to use on either the moon or Mars, although you've got to insulate them differently uh, uh, for the different thermal environment, and an Earth return vehicle that you can use to come back from either the moon or, or Mars. Although to come back from Mars, you need two stages to come back from the moon, you need one. Uh, although the compensation is that on the Mars it's much easier to make the fuel to fill it. Uh, and if you look at that set of tools, that is not a $450 billion program there. That is around, in my view, a $20 billion development with each mission by the copy costing uh, between, uh, well, about $2 billion for a Mars mission and $1 billion for a lunar mission. Uh, and if you think about that, of developing that hardware over a 10-year period, it's two billion a year. It's fifteen percent of NASA's budget. You know, I think, given that we have a space agency which is commissioned to explore space, the idea that they should spend fifteen percent of their budget to actually establish humans on the moon or Mars is, is uh, certainly a, a reasonable request, um, and something this country can easily afford. Fifteen percent of NASA's budget, less than one percent of the U.S. military budget, to open up a new world, two new worlds, uh, to humanity. Next chart. So what needs to be done right now? Start phase A. Okay. All NASA programs are divided into four phases, A, B, C, D. It's coincidence, but they follow that order. Um, <laughs> phase A is preliminary design where you develop the full mission concept in uh, some detail. 
Um, phase B is detail design. That's where you decide where all the rivets go. Phase C is you build it. Phase D is you fly it. The phase A of the NASA program typically involves less than 1% of the program cost, but around 25% of the program time. Okay? What would be ideal is if right now the President announced the Humans to Mars program, but short of that, have them announce and commit and fund the phase A of the Humans to Mars program to be completed by November of the year 2000. Why? Obviously, someone's going to come into office. You know, the next president is going to come into office in November 2000, the first president of the new century, the new millennium, and a president who can be in office for a full eight years. And the idea is to have NASA in position to throw on the desk of the president-elect in November 2000 the Phase A report and be able to say, here's our plan. Here's our, our detailed mission plan. The whole agency is willing to sign off on this level of risk. Here's our detailed cost estimates. We can have people on Mars by 2008, by the end of your second term. The choice is yours. And the reason why that must be done is because the time when a president has the most wind in his sails, has the most potential to launch a major new initiative, is the first year of his first term. And while John F. Kennedy may have had the balls to get up and say, we can go to the moon because we can do anything, okay, which is just about was the basis of him making that assertion, the, the, the absolute conviction that the United States could do anything, and therefore since going to the moon falls into that category, um, we could do that as well. They're not, but there are very few people of that stature. Right now, people need to see the numbers spelled out. So the numbers need to be developed before the guy comes into office, not after. Because if the numbers are begun to be developed in 2000, and they're available in 2003, by the end his administration is admired in sex scandals, and banker gate, and this one, and, 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 and you know, no, nothing's going to happen. Okay? So, Phase A of a Humans to Mars program probably cost on the order of $100 million. Do it over three years is $30 million a year and have negligible impact on NASA's budget. They could do it. They need to be ordered to do it. Congress needs to order them to do it. You need to call Congress and tell them. Call your congressman, okay? Write your congressman, write Clinton, write Gore, write Gingrich, and tell them that you want a Humans to Mars program launched and the very least they can do is commit to a Phase A right now, okay? Uh, if we do that, we have the chance of a major breakout to space okay, in the first decade of the 21st century. So I'm going to conclude with the final chart. I'm, I'm going to conclude with a quote, a quote that I like a lot, which I drew from a book called The Plymouth Plantation, which was written by uh, William Bradford. Bradford was the leader of the Pilgrims. And he wrote this book uh, in 1621, one year after the Mayflower landing. And um, what he's talking about here is the debate that erupted among the pilgrims in Holland. And um, they didn't like the way things were going there and didn't know what to do about it. And what one of them came up with was this totally bizarre suggestion of what they ought to do about it was uh, relocate the entire congregation from the civilized Netherlands into the wilds of North America. Because there, at least, they'd be able to cut their own path. There, there, they'd be able to make their own world. And he says the following, he says, This proposition, being made public and coming to the scanning of all, erased many variable opinions amongst men and caused many fears and doubts amongst themselves. Some, from their reasons and hopes conceived, labored to stir up and encourage the rest to undertake and prosecute the same. Others, again, out of their fears, objected against it and sought to divert from it, alleging many things, and those neither unreasonable nor improbable, as that it was a great design and subject to many unconceivable perils and dangers. It was answered that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be both enterprised and overcome with answerable courages. And I put that up there because it's got to be understood that that, and, and nothing less than that, was the kind of sheer moxie that it took to establish European civilization in North America in, in the first place. And, and that, and nothing less than that, is going to be the kind of spirit that is required to establish human beings on uh, Mars and the Moon. Because, I mean, look, I've just shown you this plan. And despite the fact that it is the cheapest Mars mission plan that has ever been uh, seriously proposed, uh, I believe that it is also the safest 
because the relatively small vessels can be completely integrated on the ground at the Cape where there's much more quality control than there could ever be in on-orbit construction because we got in situ resource utilization which allows us to back up the spaceship's life support system with oxygen that we can make on Mars because we got two completely redundant Earth return vehicles that can take us back from Mars because we got the solar flare storm shelter in zero-g and we got this down and that one and the other thing. But there's no question that it's going to be risky. It's going to be very risky. Okay, it, it's going to be extremely risky when the first people fly to Mars, and that will be the case whether we do it my way in 2007, or we abdicate historical responsibility and leave it to a far future generation and a future civilization to do it in 3007. But if you look at human history, and I don't care when you look, whether you're looking at 376 years ago, or 52 years ago, or what was done 29 years ago, okay, uh, one thing is, is very clear. Uh, and that is that nothing great has ever been accomplished without courage. Thank you.